And our presenter is called Constance Odonkor. Constance is a principal midwifery officer at a Korale Bu teaching hospital in Accra, Ghana. With, with 15 years experience and skills in maternal and newborn health, her passion for maternal and newborn health makes her exceptional in providing excellence, expert quality, care to patients and patients. Her leadership skills include inspiring, teaching, coaching, and mentoring students and staff. Currently, she's the nurse manager at Obstetrics uh, Emergency and Outpatient Department, a member of Quality Improvement and Training Team for the department. The team trains staff on standard protocols of care and evidence-based practice implementation and evaluation of care provided to patients. She had her diploma education in midwifery at the nurse, uh, nursing and midwifery uh, training college at Coralebu in 2007, after which she furthered her studies at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and obtained a Bachelor of Science in midwifery. For effective delivery role in leadership, she had the opportunity to study at University of Washington in the USA and was awarded a certificate in leadership in health management in 2022. Due to her resilience, commitment, hard work, and dedication to work activities, she was awarded the best midwife for Coralebu Teaching Hospital, which was recognized by UNFPA Ministry of Health in 2020, and she had a honorary award at the best nurse manager in 2022 at the Coralebu Teaching Hospital Obstetrics and Gynecological Department. She's married with two children. So uh, Constance will be making a presentation on sustainable midwifery, Advancing Maternal Health in Low Middle Income Countries, a focus on pre-eclampsia care in Ghana. Please uh, join me in welcoming um, Constant to make her presentation. Constant, you're most welcome. Thank you, Carol, for your kind introduction. It's very, I'm very grateful to be part of VIG in 2024. And I want to use this opportunity to wish everyone happy National Day of the Midwife. Thank you for your good work. So my presentation is going to, let's go into my outline, as said earlier by Caroline, looking at preeclampsia in Ghana. We'll look at the overview of preeclampsia, the situation in Ghana, and then our management, and as well look at the next steps that include community engagement and all that. So we'll go into in details in the next slide. We'll look at this in details, understanding the pre client epidemic. This next slide. pre is one of the most common complications of pregnancy. And I must say that it starts as a mild illness. And unfortunately, if care is not taken, they have a lot of complications. It's defined as a disorder that usually arises after 20 weeks of pregnancy or postpartum period with protein in the urine. In addition, it can also be defined as the new onset of hypertension with significant end organ dysfunction with or without proteinuria. The that diagnosis and theology is still under examination. And I must say that with preeclampsia, if we don't intervene promptly, unfortunately, we are losing our mothers, our breadwinners, our wives, that include the complications such as eclampsia, organ failure, and then maternal and fetal death. In Africa, there's a higher risk of eclampsia progression, and almost 50% of our women have seizures outside the facility, so it's a cause for concern. Please next slide. With the prevalence of preeclampsia, I must say that it accounts for up to 12% of all yearly worldwide maternal deaths. According to WHO, it's responsible for 25% of fetal and neonatal deaths. The incidence ranges between 2% and 10% of pregnancies globally. In addition, in the developed countries, it accounts for 0.4% of that. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the overall pool is about 13%, thrice that of developed countries. It tells you that in South Africa, it's really alarming. 
a study that was conducted by Dubon Sapul et al. in Accra indicated that the prevalence is about 7.9%. As well, in Tolebu Teaching Hospital, where I work, for the past two years, it's accounting for one uh, um, maternal mortality representing 25%, which is also a cause for concern. This next slide. With the risk factors, this include multi pregnancies, pre eclampsia in a previous pregnancy, chronic hypertension, nulliparity, gestational diabetes, pre gestational diabetes, maternal age 35 years or older. I must say that this, uh, this list is unexhaustive, but that's what I have on the slide. Obesity and other things can also be part of the risk factors. Thank you. Please, next slide. With the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, we have the typical and atypical signs. It's currently really on the high with regards to the atypical signs. Currently, most of our women are reporting with the atypical signs as compared to the typical sign that, that is high blood pressures, about 114.19 with a put in their urine. Women will visit our facility and they complain of severe headache, swollen foot. So that's what I have. Headaches that does not go away. Difficulty in breathing or deep sneer. Severe vomiting or nausea. Epigastric or right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Then the swollen foods, legs, which is also we need to also look at. Gaining weight rapidly, about two to five pounds in a week. So the typical signs are what we are seeing at our facilities and other peripheries as well. So we need to really take a look at that. Please, next slide. Free eclampsia in Ghana. We'll look at it in details. On this slide, it talks about Ghana's pre eclampsia statistics and its adverse fetal maternal effects. Unfortunately, as you cannot see on the slide, Pre-eclampsia is accounted for 70.4% of our preterm birth. This is alarming. In addition, it's accounting for about 38.1% of our maternal deaths occurring within 24 hours of admission. Likewise, our cases that we are um, having at the maternal mortality at the tertiary institutions, leading to what that's 31.7%. This is also on the high. Our women who deliver the percentage is about 46%. That's the rate of postpartum readmission. And this is concern. It's a really call for concern because women who also have other conditions that need could also be admitted for monitoring and all that. Women who have pre across after delivery are occupying the benefits, putting strain on the facilities, financial constraint on the part of the families and all that. So it's a worry. I must add that 45.7% of women with preeclampsia birth through cesarean session. 4.3% have placental abruptio, and as well, 5.7% of our babies are sent to the intensive care unit for continuous monitoring. In Colombo Station Hospital, our, our cesarean session rate is about 50% for the past two years, and pre eclampsia plays a role as well. Please, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Challenges with pre eclampsia management in Ghana. I have categorized that into these three challenges. That is the client side, then the health system, likewise the healthcare provider. And with the client side, the challenges include financial constraints on the part of the woman, the pregnant woman. Sometimes our women complain of lack of funds. And as, um, in addition also, they have their partners being breadwinners. So if there's no funds to support the treatment, then there's cause for concern. In addition, there's also misconception with regards to the care of pre and with the management of preeclampsia. Some women assume that when they have this um, signs and symptoms, such as the swollen foot and all that, they are going to have twin delivery or they are going to have a male child, which needs to be cleared. We are working on that. And it, it's a really call for concern. They think that if they have swollen foot, then they are going to have a male child. Therefore, they wouldn't come for prompt treatment. Likewise, the health personnel. I must emphasize that with the, with the client's challenges, it's also in our part of the world, our women are currently 
also visiting their um, um, relatives and also visiting their pastors. They would also let you know that until the pastor says she should come to the facility as a challenge. So with the swollen food, the blood vision and all that, that can lead to eclampsia. They are still at the prayer camps praying, which is not the best at all. So these are some of the challenges we got the, the clans session. In addition, with the health system, the health system also challenges include lack of ambulance on some of the peripheries. Women are, are referred to us and then they come in a taxi. You inquire and they tell you that unfortunately, the ambulance that they have has broken down. And also the one function has also has to take other cases to other peripheries. So it's a cause for concern, lack of ambulances to, um, to help um, facilitate the cases to the previous um, peripheries is a concern. In addition, the health system itself they don't, sometimes don't have the right skilled personnel to take good care or give quality care to our women. The care is so important. If we don't have the right skilled um, personnel to give quality care, unfortunately, our women will be dying. In addition, lack of logistics with regards to the system. The facilities or the procurement team are not able to give the right medications for them to augment the care they are giving. So the system is also really not helping, such as some places don't have the laboratory to be able to do the, um, just minor investigations. So women have to travel far to go to what, have laboratory services. This is also some of the challenges. Therefore, it becomes a concern and delay is dangerous. In addition, with the health personnel or the health care provider, sometimes if they have to refer to us, there's challenge, there's delay in referring. A case has to be referred from the health post or the health center before they get to us. Unfortunately, the harm has already been caused. There's nothing much we can stop because they are delaying. You are seeing the science centers, the DP is about 160, 110, and you don't even have the medications, the basic medications, essential medications to help reduce the blood pressures, but there's delay. So when they get to the facility, unfortunately, there's nothing much we can do. So that's about it. In addition, when it comes to, they don't have the necessary logistics. Syringes to give just, for instance, magnesium sulfate. They don't have the right syringes to give the medications. This essential medication should be at the emergency uh, unit or room. Some of them do not have. And some also complain the lack of um, financial control with regards to the patient. So when they give the medication, some relatives or some um, can't really pay back, and the, the, the hospital unfortunately run at a loss. Therefore, they are way in between. We should not be. This is what we are facing with regards to the healthcare provider. In addition, some also have that like, that's ad attitude. That's an emergency, all hands on deck. Some are rather going up and down. Delay is dangerous. So we should appreciate what we are doing. And then the standardized protocols are not there. Some do not have the standardized protocols to take care of the case. And facility A is doing this, facility B is doing that. So there's no standardized protocol of care, which is unfortunately is detrimental to the health of the woman. In addition, poor documentation. Women are referred to facilities and the documentation is just not the best. What happened, the medication was given and all that has not been documented. And lack of training in service as well for our health personnel as a challenge. I must say that all this has been stipulated on the slide. Gati et al. also um, gave that in her study and the results are the same as compared to the others. Please, next slide. Preeclampsia, how does preeclampsia look like in collaboration hospital? I must say that Collaboration Hospital is a special institution. Our women are referred from the various peripheries and regions to us. And when they report, our assessment is a vital thing we do. We have to go through the various assessments that include checking up on the static country, checking up the vital signs, ensuring that this is what we are dealing with. And then the signs and things, for instance, the swollen foot and all that help us and they can give prompt intervention. Collaboration Hospital, as, as I said earlier on, is a social institution. So it's a multidisciplinary team. We have our NICU at the facility, that's an initial intensive care unit, 
where women who would have to undergo immediate surgery session with regards to the information or the assessment at hand, babies are sent to NICU for further management. We have a team of officialists who will take prompt action to ensure that we save the life of our women. So when these women report, we go through the triaging system and all that, and then we intervene as such with the standardized protocol of care. We ensure that the women, our women go through the space successfully. In addition, as you can all see on the slide, based on poor management, things sometimes do not go on well. A typical case, some of our cases we see on daily basis. So there's this woman who was ad admitted or referred to our facility on account of severe preeclampsia. Um, we had to go and see this woman at a car park in an ambulance. And on our assessment, on our assessment, unfortunately, so they helped the, the, the team of doctors and then the midwives went to this kind of way they can we assess. On our assessment, we realized that vital signs could not be recorded and everything was just fitter heart rate. So it is a 50 year old woman who had undergone in, in vitro fertilization. She's been married for 20 years and fortunately, she had twin gestation, about 34 plus weeks to gestation in the third trimester. This was one of our sad days. When we assessed this woman, there was no cardiopulmonary activity. Babies were unfortunately, we couldn't hear the fetal heart rate. Indication that we unfortunately had lost this 50-year-old woman and her twins. This is so sad. This is so pathetic. Why should our woman, why should our woman be dying on account of severe preeclampsia? This as a result of poor management. Prompt intervention was not taken. You, well, you bear with me that during the, the previous slide, I said the BPs could be, the BPs are high, but sometimes there might be no process in the urine. On the slide, the BPs were above the normal, but the facility ignored all the signs because there were no proteins in the urine and they didn't manage this woman and they didn't refer on time. So we lost this woman, a breadwinner, a mother, a wife, a sister. Our women should not be dying on account of this. It is important we refer our cases, our patients, our women on time for us to quickly intervene. This was one of our sad moments at the facility. The entire team was very devastated and I will never forget such incidents. So that's one of my passions to ensure that our women do not die. Therefore, we should all come on board to ensure that if our women are having the signs and symptoms, severe headache, swollen foot, blood vision, we quickly have to refer on time so we can save the life of our women. Thank you. Please, next slide. So, let's look at the challenges from our periphery facilities that we receive at our that's called Abutation Hospital. Late referral of cases to the facility from the peripheries. It's so alarming that our women, unfortunately, are referred at the last point. For instance, when they start having their clamsa and all that convulsion, before they refer, that should not happen. There's delay in referral. For instance, a woman who had been referred from the health post or the health center, the team of midwife um, assessing or seeing this woman needs to quickly refer when it's above the normal. They have their criteria for referral, but unfortunately, some do not do in the way to the last hour. And when they report to us, it's so sad. The prognosis is not really encouraging. Furthermore, poor management of cases. As I said, there's no standard protocol of care for some of, in other, other, in some of the facilities. You don't know where some facilities are giving magnesium sulfate. They don't know, the protocol is A, others are, are abiding by the protocol B. So there's no standardized evidence-based care at some of the facilities. So it's a challenge. The, the anti-hypertensives, the, anti the social medications, some do not even know when to start the dosage they should give and all that as a call for concern. 
and our poor women are devastated because they trust us and they ensure that we give them the best care. So if they come to us and they are vulnerable and we can't give them the best care, then it's alarming. Poor documentation. It will interest you to know that in my facility, some of the cases refer from the peripheries. The women report to us and you find out from the team, what time did you give this medication? They don't know. What time did you enter this woman's urine? They have them document documented. The referral letter is just not the best. You don't have information to work with. And, we, and the nature of the job is continuity of care. It's therefore essential that we have the documentation at hand. So if you don't document, where are we going to start from? Quality healthcare is the best. So if we don't have the information, we can't salvage anything. So there's poor documentation of some of the cases from the peripheries. And that's some of the challenges. In addition, lack of logistics. Some don't have the right logistics to work with. They run out of the, the, the common syringes to give the medications and other, other essential medications that would need to be given to this woman to help save her life. Some have to travel far to go and buy medications for them to help save lives. That should not be. The procurement, unfortunately, is not sometimes not supporting other facilities. They, go, they run to the, the procurement unit or the stores and they don't have those medications there. This should be the essential things that we need to help save our women, our breadwinners, our mothers. Inadequate skilled personnel. I must say that some of the facilities do not have the right skilled personnel. They are just people, some people have been trained on their job or some who are assisting, that they have assistants and all that. That should not be. Women should know the obstetric care, how to manage obstetric emergency. Some do not have it. So it's just sometimes try and error. A woman should not undergo this ordeal. And you ask and there's nothing, they, they, are, they are just lamenting. They don't know what to tell you. It's sad. Cases from some of our peripheries is just unbearable. Lack of standardized protocol, as I said earlier on, is not streamlined. They don't know what they are doing. Someone say we are doing A, we are following A protocol. Another facility is following B protocol. And our women are unfortunately at the mercy of that. They are vulnerable, but they, they entrusted our people, our health personnel, and things are not going well. So by the time they get to us, the prognosis is not the best. Delay in decision making. The woman, is based on your criteria referral, is the condition is above the normal. Let the woman report to us immediately at the social institution where with the multidisciplinary team will be able to save her life some delay in referring and they get to us at the too late. So these are some of the challenges we are facing in our facility. Please, next slide. We'll look at this in detail, strengthening the fair council management. Please, next slide. I must say that as a midwifery manager, my passion to ensure that we give quality care to our women is one of my hallmarks and I'm so fulfilled when I'm able to, as a, with a team, able to execute this. So on daily basis, we, I find out from my women or the pregnant women what we should do for them. What are the challenges? And some go like, they are scared. So to allay fear and anxiety, we, we, we reassure them, let them know that they are the safe place. It's a safe institution based on their condition. We have to ensure that we give them the prompt and the quality care to help save the life of their baby, likewise themselves. So this has part of it. And then based on this information, as I, I must add that, we have the quality improvement team on board. It's made up of chiefs. We have 15 members. This include uh, midwives, uh, doctors, our physicians, or our physicians, and then our pharmacists. We have our vice physicians on board, our human resource personnel on board, and then also we have our administrators on board. Together, we form the quality team that help us give the best care to our women. So based on this data collected or we receive from the various facilities and likewise our facility, together, this data help us drive and give the best, implement the best um, standardized protocols of care. So with good communication, we together collaborate with other referral facilities. So for instance, facility A, has been referring such um, cases to us with severe pre and all that. And looking at the data, we visit such facilities, and then with networking, we are able 
to review the household system with management, and then we implement the best practices that the standardized protocol of care. And this has helped drive decision making and has helped also improve the care with these interventions. I must say that the quality improvement team has been really, really, really engaging. They've really, really been supportive and it has really, really shaped the care we give to our patients. That is the quality expert care we give to our patients. And that initiative has helped us also given back to um, other peripheries, and it has been really tremendous. Please, next slide. With our interventions, and the interventions at Calibutation Hospital, that's obstetric department, I must say that based on the information that we had at hand, the team together had currently provided a television at the outpatient department where educated program is telecast on the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. So whilst they come to the facility, whilst waiting to be seen by their doctors, they watch whilst this signs and symptoms of preeclampsia is being telecast and they are able to engage, ask questions. I must add that apart from the telecast of the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, there are also other educated programs as well, care of the newborn, labor science and all that. In addition, whilst the, we are telecasting this educative program, we have daily health education that is done by our midwives. They explain whatever is being telecast to our women, clear or mis clarify misconceptions, educate them, let them know what they are watching, and that makes them more interactive, and then they are able to really, really pay attention to be able to intervene when necessary. Based on the data I have at hand, as I said earlier on, with my team together, I realized that the cases on the peripheries, when they report to us, our midwives will be lamenting the cases that were referred to us, there's poor documentation, women were not given the right medications, there were no midwives accompanying and all that. We're like, okay, fine. What can we do as a team? Because we have to use data to help drive decision, to help implement the best care. So we put, we put our heads together like, no, we should get a register at the facility, at the emergency ward. So we have a, a, a register at the emergency ward. And what this register does is that cases from the peripheries with all those challenges are documented at the register. So a midwife reports to work and we had a referral. There was no accompanying midwife and they brought the preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia. And then based on all this, we do tabul tabulation of the statistics every month. And then all this is helped in decision making where we get to know where the bad cases are coming from, poor prognosis and all that, cases where the management did not go well. We use this to and this is those such facilities where we implement other diet protocols of care and then with the team on board, we help change the narrative. So this data or this register at the obstetric emergency room is really serving a purpose and I must say that it's been one of our interventions and has changed the narrative at some of the peripheries. Furthermore, we have our triaging system in place. So our triaging system, which is managed by a mid midwife, is basically we sorting the cases out in other of agency, more agents and all that. So when the clients report to us, assuming Madam A reports to the facility earlier than Madam B, and based on our assessment, Madam, Madam A has what we call, uh, she's a latent phase, latent phase of labor, whereas Madam B, based on assessment, has preeclampsia. Obviously, we are going to see Madam B first because of the underlying assessment at hand, although Madam A reported earlier. And this has helped reduce morbidities and mortalities based on this intervention. So with the color coding system, we are able to know that, okay, with a red color coding means that the woman should be seen right away immediately, all hands from deck. Orange, the woman should be seen is urgent. Within, within 15 minutes, one should be seen. So in that order, the midwife then goes to the emergency room and then tells the team whatever her assessment. And then the team together on board help continue the care. And that's what help save reduce mobilities and mortality. In addition, I want to add that we have our pregnancy school in place. 
our pregnancy school was birthed out of the challenges we, we face at the facility. This includes, you know, we all do have our uh, television at, um, at the emergency OPD. Sometimes our women are in a hurry to go back to their workplace or other social activities. Therefore, there's a little distraction. So we said, well, how can we bridge the gap? So we have the pregnancy school institution in that has been instituted that which has helped uh, bridge the gap where our women are taken through the um, education regards to pregnancy, care of the newborn, signs of preeclampsia and all that. It is, it is organized twice in a month, first and second and fourth week of every month is on a Saturday. And this pregnancy school has really been, it's free. It is open to the public. And then our women go through this pregnancy school and then when they deliver, we have a graduation every November each year. Every November, the same year, actually. And then it's fun filled. They are excited. They learn. They have peer to peer interaction and all that. And our woman has given feedback that shows that it has really, really, really been very educative. And Kolebuchi has um, and given our department an applaud for institution our pregnancy school, which has all saved lives. Please, next slide. So with the outcomes, I must say that there's been reduction of cases from the peripheries due to this intervention. There's early reporting of signs and symptoms to the facility for prompt intervention, such as the, tele the telecasting of our preeclampsia videos, our pregnancy school, our triaging system, and all that. Improvements of skilled personnel are the peripheries, because we visit them, and then we are able to implement the best practices. There's monthly training and workshops that are, that's organized for staff as well, as well as simulation exercises, whereby when they are able to go to the simulation exercise, when they, I mean, when they meet the real situation, they will not be found, they will not be found wanting. We will to educate and give the quality care our women need, our mothers need. In addition, as a midwifery manager, one of my ultimate goal is to ensure that we do not lack logistics and consumables. With my team on board together, we ensure that we give the best or supply our facility or our unit logistics to work with. We are kind of a special institution, and therefore we have no excuse to say we don't have us, we don't have medications, we don't have this. No, we will always ensure that we have our logistics to work with. That has helped improve the care. And our mothers have given us feedback that shows that they are satisfied and that makes us fulfilled. That makes us fulfilled because what we have been able to meet their needs. It has relayed and has reduced anxiety and fear because they know that when they at our facility they are assured of the best services because they are, are paramount in the care we are given. Respect for maternal care is also one of our hallmark as well. Please, next slide. So with the recommendations, I might say that we need to continue training of our staff on management of preeclampsia. We should continue our antenatal education for pregnant women and their families. In addition, the provision of logistics and equipment for staff at the peripheries. It is so important we do that because when we have all this at the peripheries, we will be able to help save lives and also reduce mobilities and mortalities and complications. Implementation of standardized protocols and evidence-based practice. We should be able to have the standardized protocols so that we are all singing the same song. This is the standardized protocol of care. So nobody is going to undermine this protocol. There should be adequate personnel at the facilities that would help save lives. We should have the right skilled personnel. In addition, there should be proper documentation of care provided to patients. As I said earlier on, what are we working with? We don't have any information to work with. So if we have the information, we'll continue the care and that would lead to what saving life of our women and our babies. So if we don't have the right documentation or the proper documentation of whatever has been given at the, at the peripheries, we can't salvage anything. We need to get that. Lastly, facilities should also have quality improvement team that will help with the monitoring, supervision, and evaluation of care. 
Because Kolebu, we have our quality improvement team. It helps the check and balances. We are able to intervene and help provide the best quality of care based on the data. This drives the decision making. And at the end of the day, we are able to save our women. And that is our fulfillment. That makes us fulfilled. That makes me fulfilled as a midwife, helping save their life. Because the woman we are saving could be my own relative, could be your relative, could be a sister, could be a friend. So we'll look at that in detail, how we have to keep up the pace with regards to pre eclampsia management. This includes community engagement, our training needs, and all that is so important. We, have, we shouldn't undermine that our women who are visiting the churches and all that, we have to target those places. We said that the women know that, no, we are not saying you shouldn't go to church and pray, but your health is also paramount. If we get to them, the marketplaces, stakeholders, NGOs, and everybody coming on board, we would, they would also appreciate the fact that this science and symptoms you are experiencing, it is not, I must say that, it is not normal. You are not going to have twins. You are not going to have a boy quickly intervene because the atypical signs are killing our women. As I said, 50% of our women are having eclampsia outside the facility. So we need to all come on board to help change the narrative, to help save their life, to help save our women because they are the breadwinners. They are officially this. So let's help together.